Hello everyone, welcome back. We are going to continue with our topic of asset pricing and interest rates. Today we are going to focus on calculating the return for holding a bond. Now holding period return is the return for holding the bond when you sell it before its maturity date. Now this return can be distinctively different from your yield to maturity. Yield to maturity was calculated when you knew the purchase price, face value and the time to maturity given some coupon payments. This yield to maturity is the internal rate of return for holding the bond till maturity date. However, the return can be very different because return can be calculated after two years, three years, five years, some time period before the actual end number of years. So whatever is your actual maturity date, if you liquidate your asset before that date and sell it at a different price, you can calculate your holding period return. Holding period return is actually more important in some ways because it tells us how financially well you are doing for holding a particular particular asset. And in order to calculate it, we need to know the price at which you're selling the bond. So your future price and also if you have received any coupon payments for holding this bond. So my return can be calculated as the price at which I'm selling the bond minus my purchase price plus any coupon payments received divided by my purchase price. If the bond has matured in this time period, then you would not have a new price, but simply a face value. So we can play around with this formula given the specific characteristics of the asset that we are holding. We can split it into two parts. The first part is giving me my rate of capital gain and I can donate it as IG. Second part, remember, is the same as your current yield for your coupon bond. It's your coupon payment divided by the purchase price. So that tells us that the return depends upon the rate of capital gain and on the current yield. Current yield does not change over time because if I'm receiving a set coupon payment of $100, at my given purchase price of a thousand, this current yield will remain constant. Therefore, the return fluctuates because of changes in your rate of capital gain over here. Let's do a few examples in order to understand the calculation of return for holding different type of bonds. In my example, I have a 10 year bond, which is giving you a face value of a thousand dollars. It is a 10% coupon rate. So that immediately tells you my coupon payment is of hundred dollars. And next I know that I purchased this bond at a 10 percent interest rate. So if the coupon rate is 10 percent and my interest rate was 10 percent at the time of purchase, it gives you my purchase price of one thousand dollars. We discussed this last time that whenever the coupon rate is equal to the yield to maturity, your price will be equal to face value. So the return on my bond for one year will depend upon my coupon payment, the price at which I will sell it for and the price at which I purchase this bond. Given all of this information, I can calculate the holding period return for my security. If I know the interest rate one year from now, I can calculate my price at which I will be selling this security. Let's assume that after one year, interest rates remain constant at 10%. So my discount rate is not changing. So it's the same face value of 1000. My coupon rate is the same 10% what would be the new price? Given this new price, I can now calculate return. Now I have already calculated it over here for you. Notice this is my current yield. This is not changing coupon payment divided by the purchase price of a thousand. My new price minus my purchase price as a percentage of my purchase price. And this is giving me a total return of 10%. So how did I calculate my price of $1,000 one year from now. Note again that if your coupon rate is 10% and interest rate after a year is also 10%, the same rule applies. My price remains at face value and the new price is again $1,000. Let's do another example of interest rates actually rising one year from now. So if the interest rates go up from 10 to 12%, you should be able to predict that your price will now go down. Remember because prices are your present value calculations. So you return will now depend again upon your current yield which is again 10% plus your rate of capital gain. So if interest rate is rising to 12% my new price is 893 and this is lower than my purchase price of a thousand dollars and in this case my rate of capital gain is negative and it is pushing my overall return down to be a negative number in this case 0.7%. Remember we have to calculate our new price or the price after one year given the new interest 
substrate and given the time to maturity for this asset. And it would be the same formula that we did in our previous video, but just given the new information that you have. So briefly, what did we learn over here? If interest rates remain constant and your price was at par initially, your price will remain at par. However, if interest rates go up, price is going down. If interest rates in the future go down, prices can rise and your overall return will be dependent upon your rate of capital gain going up or down. So returns could drastically go down or returns could drastically go up depending upon interest rate movements. Let's look at different type of bonds all with a face value of $1,000. The difference over here is basically dependent upon their time to maturity. They all are 1,000 bonds with a coupon rate of 10%, meaning your coupon value is $100 but the time to maturity varies all the way from 1 to 30 years. Now, assuming the current yield was 10%, all of these bonds will have an initial price of $1,000. Why? Remember, interest rate, if it's equal to your coupon rate, your price is equal to the face values. After one year, let's assume interest rate rise to 20%. So you can predict now that price after one year for all of these different type of bonds will go down. And we can see these prices are already calculated for you over here. Prices for all of these securities have gone down except for my one year bond. This is consistent with our present value calculation. Higher the interest rate, lower is the price. And remember, this is your future interest rate or interest rate after one year. So this is your capital loss. Let's focus on my one year bond. For my one year bond, price after one year has not changed. Why not? Because this bond has matured. Its time to maturity was a year. So it's giving me my face value of $1,000. All of these other bonds have still some years to maturity and hence they will have some new present value calculation that will give you your new price after one year. So all of these prices have gone down for these securities because they have still not matured. Our return is a total of your current yield plus your capital gain. Current yield is going to be 10% for all of these securities. Why? Because they all are giving us a 10% coupon rate. So they give us $100 every year and $100 divided by $1,000 is your 10% current yield for all these bonds. Capital gain can be very different for all of these securities. For my bond which has matured, capital gain is zero because I received my face value for 1000 So my face value is the same as my purchase price. However, for all these securities which have not matured, it's actually negative. And why? Because the price received after a year has now gone down. Another thing to remember over here is that your bigger fluctuations are in bonds which have longer terms to maturity and a smaller fluctuation in price of those bonds which have relatively shorter terms to maturity. So let's look at some key conclusions from our table which was showing us bonds with different maturities but the same face value of $1000 and depending upon their time to maturity we saw if interest rates have gone up prices have actually gone down. So your return is dependent upon the interest rate one year from now. And what do we see? If the return equals the yield to maturity only if the holding period is also equal to the time to maturity. In our example, this was the case for our one year bond. For all those other bonds which had still some years remaining to maturity, we saw that prices actually went down. Higher the interest rate, fall in the bond price and that resulted in your capital loss. And longer the time to maturity, bigger was the percentage change in your price and therefore we saw bigger drop in prices for long-term bonds. Because your rate of capital gain is directly affecting your return on the bond, if your rate of capital gain is going down, it is pushing the overall return on the bond down as well. So the higher the interest rate, lower the price and therefore lower the return on your bond and the bigger drop was in your long-term maturities. This phenomena that we just described of interest rates rising or falling and therefore causing your prices to fluctuate and therefore causing returns to become higher or lower in our example they were actually becoming negative is called interest rate risk and we can describe it as the change in the bond price due to the change in interest rates. 
the longer the time to maturity bigger was the fluctuation in your price and therefore higher volatility for long-term bonds and they are exposed to higher interest rate risk if your holding period is exactly the same as your time to maturity there is no interest rate risk in that case you are getting your yield to maturity that you had expected to get at the time of purchase of the bond let's do a simple example of how to calculate price after one year for a bond now in this example I have a bond with a face value of 1000. Uh, it is maturing in 10 years. The coupon rate on the bond is 10% and the interest rate right now is 10%. So we have to now first calculate the price today and then the price after one year. In this case, you can see the coupon rate is exactly equal to the interest rate. So we know that the price today is exactly equal to face value or $1000. Now, after one year, when I calculate the price, I need to know what is the new interest rate. And now we're assuming interest rate have risen from 10 to 20 percent what is the price at which i will be potentially selling this bond for any bond whenever you have to calculate the price always visualize the income stream that you're getting so you're still going to get the c dollar coupon payments but now for the remaining nine years and at the time of maturity you will also get your face value so that's my income stream i have to, in order to price the bond i have to calculate the present value of the coupon payments and the present value of my face value. So we can again use our formula for price of a coupon bond, where the first term over here is giving us the present value of our coupon payments, and the second term over here is giving you the present value of your face value. Face value has not changed, it's still $1,000 interest rate has gone up so i must use the new interest rate and note that after one year there are only nine years to maturity so n must be now equal to nine it's reduced by one likewise for present value of my coupon payments the c dollar coupon payment is still going to be the same because it's a coupon rate of 10 percent it always give me a coupon payment of hundred dollars using my calculator these come out to be as approximately 403.10 plus 193.81 and price of the bond after one year is coming out to be approximately 596 point 91 dollars so this is our price of the bond after one year in all our pricing calculations we worked with exogenously provided interest rates so some discount rate at which you are discounting the future cash flow now the classical theory states that differences in interest rates are primarily because of differences in the characteristic of assets and we can express the appropriate discount rate as dependent upon the real interest rate, expected inflation, you want to be compensated for the risk of default, you also want to be compensated for some maturity premium, liquidity premium, and lastly exchange rate premium if it's a foreign asset. Most of the time when we are comparing assets, we have assets which have similar characteristics in terms of their default risk, in terms of their maturity, uh, liquidity, and the exchange rate risk so what we're left with is only the real interest rate and your expected inflation two and these three alone now give us what we call our fisher equation fisher equations gives us the relationship between nominal and real interest rate nominal interest rate includes some expectation of inflation or they're not adjusted for inflation whereas real interest rates are adjusted for changes in price level or inflation real interest rates can be calculated ex ante or ex post if i'm working with some expectation of inflation i'll be calculating my real interest rate ex ante if i'm working with my actual given level of inflation i can calculate my ex post real interest rate a major takeaway from your fisher equation is that whenever inflation is higher or is expected to go up it will cause your nominal interest rates to go up and whenever inflation is going up it will cause your real interest rates to actually go down and if inflation is quite high it can actually cause your real interest rates to become negative why is the distinction between nominal and real interest rates important the primary reason over here is that your real interest rates more accurately reflect the true cost of borrowing and therefore will tell us the true incentive for borrowers to borrow in an economy whenever your real interest rates is low there is a greater incentive for borrowers to borrow more and we can see that with a simple example in the global covid pandemic we have seen central banks across the globe slashing their nominal interest rates so let's assume our nominal interest rates rate is very low close to 0.25 percent and the expected inflation is 
two percent which is quite true for canada it's our inflation rate is currently quite close to two percent nominal adjusted for inflation gives me a negative interest rate of 1.75 percent so these days we are working with actually negative real interest rates this is a huge incentive for borrowers to borrow more so your central banks are globally slashing nominal interest rates why to drive up credit demand borrowers wants to start borrowing more investment will go up it will give the economy a push in the right direction and economy will gradually come out of the major global recession that we are currently in however if your real interest rates are negative the problem is that lenders are not willing to lend so even though we are stimulating the borrowers there the lenders might not be willing to lend in this market it becomes very difficult for actual credit creation to take place so the economy could be facing a very bad credit crunch let's look at this time series data for real and nominal interest rates you can see that while they often move in the same direction it's not always the same in some cases you can see while your nominal interest rates are rising your real interest rates are actually negative and this could be explained by our fisher equation so nominal are high and real is actually negative that tells you inflation was very very high in the 1970s again we see negative interest rates over here during and after the financial crisis here again you see central banks drastically slashing their nominal interest rates and therefore we again see real interest rates becoming negative so this is all for now. Next time I'll meet you guys with our bond market analysis in which we will be determining the equilibrium price and yield for a given bond.